All right, let me start again. Today, as we're talking about God's word for you in a changing world, our conversation that Pastor Jeff is centering on is resilience around perseverance. And as I kept looking at that word, I kept coming back to the fact that we are called to discern some really hard things in life. So I am going to share with you a document. If I can find it now that I'm on this. Um, screen share. And that we're going to talk about what it means to discern something. Um, as people of the church, we talk about pastors discerning their call into ministry. But I believe that you as congregational members and as the wider world, we're always discerning right from wrong and things that drive us in life. I talk to my kids a lot about we need to talk about like good choices and bad choices. And that is a process of discernment. And so today we are talking about in discernment, what are the rules you live your life by? So some little catchphrases are do your best, never give up, never say never, just do it. Those are considered your rules for life. And so Today, the scripture that is going to drive our discernment is taken from the Gospels or from the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, verses 42. And it says, believers devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And I think that the reason that scripture stood out to me is because those are things that can help you in discerning your rules for life. So um, bear with me a second. And I want to talk about how one would go about finding their own rules for life. So in the document, there's a set of questions to help you figure out what really rules your life. So what's most important to you? What gives you a sense of security and self-worth? Where do your relationships need attention? Who do you want to become? I like the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? If you could write down your own eulogy, what would it say? Where do you want to change? Where do you feel powerless to change? I think those questions are really um, really important, especially in this time of Lent, as we consider all of these things that Jesus went through for us and turning introspective to how that affects our lives, right? How Jesus's death on the cross really does affect us still today. So I would like for your discerning this next week, your, your spiritual practice to try to figure out what your rule for life is. So maybe spend some time each morning and um, answer these questions or just sit with that question in front of you and see where it leads you. So the process to go through some of those um, questions is for these simple rules of life. So in discerning what your rule is, Dedicate every morning to the glory of God, right? Sit in these questions and think about how does the answer to this question glorify God? Confess your sins before you go to bed. Um, that could be a spiritual practice in and of itself is to talk to God and confess the things that weighed heavy on your heart for the day. Another thing could be to simply don't hold a grudge and to forgive others. A simple thing, which maybe is the hardest for me, maybe Pastor Jeff can relate, is to eat sensibly. I love food. It is my comfort, right? And Kira, and I, I'm wondering I'm wondering why you looked at the fat guy when you said that. Just was wondering. I'm not looking at the fat guy. I'm looking at the guy who always says, <laughs> and obviously I don't meet, miss many meals. <laughs> He brought that, you brought that on yourself. <laughs> I did. Thanks for your good humor. I get yes. it. And then to give all of our wanderings to God, right? Like I know, especially for me, that um, when I get lost, typically in the evening as I'm scrolling through Facebook and I hit the 
the video reels and I watch, they're usually TikToks, but I don't have TikTok, but I watch these videos of people and I get so lost in it. And to me, that's a wandering, right? Like I go down this rabbit hole of mindlessness where if I just spent that time and focused on God and my relationship with God, I could define some things in my life. So I know that this is a very broad discernment, right? Like this is hard. And I'm asking you to figure out what are the rules that you live by your life, live your life by. And so I'm going to move on to a scripture. So another way you can figure out what your rule for life is, is to open up your Bible and we call it dwelling in the word, but open up your Bible and pick a verse and just read it to yourself and see what sticks out to you, where it's calling you, and then write it down. Write down where you're being called by that passage, not necessarily what the scripture was, and do it for like the week. And then on Tuesday, look back at each one of the things that you wrote down and see if you can see a theme, right? Is it I'm seeing God's asking me to be still and pay attention more? Am I seeing that um, there's a lot of lost people in these texts and maybe God's calling me to pray about other people, right? And then see if you can write down what your rule for life is, right? I will spend every morning in prayer praying for God's people because that's what I found as a theme. So our practice today is going to work through a psalm. So if you flip your page over and Kirsten and Pastor Jeff, there is yours. The blue, the, all the words are taken from scripture except for the red. The red might be what the scripture is calling you to do. Okay, so I am going to read the passage, but I will never read the red words. And I will pause for you to read the red words yourself and just kind of sit with it for a minute because those statements could again be a rule for life, right? Like your discernment and how you're gonna live. So again, I'll just stop at the blue. Don't be nervous, but we're gonna sit in silence. Psalm 16, a song of trust and security in God. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a godly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. Keep the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices, my body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. It's
in your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So again, this week, as you go through your week, I just invite you to take time discerning God in your life and where you are really truly called as Christians to go and be and do in this world. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Kira. You're welcome. And thanks everybody also for being here today. Um, does everybody have access to the handout? And can you, Kirsten, you don't have it, I guess. I wonder, can you put that up on the screen for us, Kira? I sure will. Perfect. Can I ask a question? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So in our reading for the week, do we read a, like a whole psalm like this? Because there's an awful lot of things that... You know what, Chris? You sure could, right? So some people in their spiritual practices actually read texts that are prescribed for the day. Like if you go to the back of your Bible, a lot of times there is a daily text to read. Some people open it up and just point. Some people read and they get a verse done and that really is like unsettling to them. It really is peaceful to them. And so really it's where your heart is drawn to in your discernment. Um, if you feel like like starting at the beginning of the Psalms and kind of reading through and just stopping where you're driven to stop, I think that's the right place to stop. That's the hard part about these spiritual practices because as much as we can like guide and say like, this would be really nice to like try this, whenever your mind starts to wander or you have a question about what you're reading or like something brings you just peace and stillness respond to those moments and truly sit in what that feeling is because you'll find much more as opposed to reading a whole book in the bible if you just stop where that is driven mm -hmm. thank that's a good question thank you Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have to pull it up, Jeff. Just give me one quick second. Great. Well, we are continuing on this conversation about uh, how we might search God's word in the midst of this changing world, um, recognizing that, that one of the qualities or spiritual gifts that we really, really yearn for is resilience. Resilience. And today, we're going to focus on that key word of perseverance and recognize that perseverance is one of the characteristics of resilience that uh, that we can pray for, that we can see demonstrated in scripture and in other people's lives, and that maybe we even ought to think about um, uh, trying to develop in our lives. Uh, because I think that nobody really is naturally able to persevere. I think it's a learned skill. I think it's something that we that we gain over time with experience and also with some good teachers. So as, as a starter, one of the things I just decided to do with this study is to, is to lift up some, some everyday kinds of conversations. Um, many theologians over the years have said that, that the, the wise Christian is someone who carries the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in another. So that we, not, we need to recognize that as we live our lives as disciples in Christ, as we walk through daily life, we do it carrying two tools. One is the awareness of God's presence through scripture, the story of the faith, uh, the wonderful power of Jesus' life. But also on the other hand, we need to realize that we live in a real world, a world that provides blessings and challenges, opportunities and sometimes curses, and sometimes, uh, sometimes some very, very difficult situations. And, and here you'll see these quotes. Um, and I'd like to just read them for you. And then maybe, maybe we'll reflect on them just a little bit. This first quote, uh, if you have read anything of Churchill, you won't be surprised by how this quote comes off. Churchill said, if you are going through hell, keep going. Keep going. Now, uh, I know that maybe some of you are more familiar with the realities of World War II than others, but right now, um, the specter of war in Europe is something that we haven't really had for, for 85 years now, is it? My goodness, something like that. 
And so when Churchill was sitting on the other side of the pond, uh, wondering about whether or not they would survive the Battle of Britain, whether or not Nazism would control the world, uh, one of the things that he needed to make sure people understood was that, yeah, things were really pretty bad. But if we sit here and stay in this bad stuff, we're going to be stuck. So if you're going through hell, keep going. Now, to take it from the 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 kind of this this uh, completely interesting story about about a real life thing, how about somebody like Julie Andrews? Um, uh, maybe some of you know about Julie Andrews in her later life. Uh, many of you know how famous she was for her musicals. Maybe you could name your own from from The Sound of Music to uh, um, to Mary Poppins. But did you know that at the end of her life or towards the end of her life, she experienced a horrible um, mistake, accident with some surgery. This beautiful voice of hers was, was destroyed because of some surgery that was being done to prepare, repair her, her vocal cords, but she can't sing anymore. She can't sing anymore. She said, perseverance is failing 19 times and succeeding on the 20th. Now, if I want to see Perseverance, I will look at the videos that are being sent to us from our grandkids on the West Coast, our little grandson, Soren. Uh, he has received these, these things called magnetiles. Do you know what they are? They're these plastic pieces that have magnets all around them, and you construct all sorts of cool things with them. And, and he is trying desperately right now to build a garage big enough to hold one of his great big dump trucks. As a less than three-year-old boy, it's not working out so well for him, but the kid just doesn't give up. He doesn't give up. One of the ways that we learn that we grow is, is through using iteration. That means to, to try something and then to change it just a little bit and try again. So I think Julie Andrews was onto something, and so is my grandson, Soren. Now, if you want to see somebody in our own most recent history, somebody who exhibited perseverance in the world, uh, look no further than Martin Luther King Jr. I always need to clarify when uh, when uh, when teaching confirmation class that I'm not talking about that 15th century um, reformer. I'm talking about this uh, this guy who was in, in, involved in in reformation of his own. Uh, but but Luther King, Martin Luther King, said this. He said, "If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't." walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Um, what do you all remember? And, and, and Kirsten, I suppose you and probably, um, probably Kira too, but, but the rest of us who might have a few more, uh, a few more gray hairs and a little bit more age under our belt. Do you remember, what do you remember about this Martin Luther King and, and the perseverance he had in those marches, does does he strike you as somebody who exhibited perseverance? This is the audience participation portion. I would say he had perseverance, right? Like he was he was pushing and articulating something that society had not welcomed. And he, nothing really stopped him. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with, um, with the stories about how he was uh, beaten and jailed? In fact, if you want to, if you want to read, um, if you want to read something that, that almost looks like a letter that Paul could have written, pick up Martin Luther King's book called A Letter from a Birmingham Jail. It talks about the reality of perseverance and how how for folks who were fighting for civil rights understood that it was a fight that they just simply couldn't give up. And even now today, as we think about the civil rights that people experience, we realize that that fight might not be over. Uh, Samuel Johnson, a fellow said this, great works are performed not by strength, but by perseverance. I know that that's true. Perseverance is not a long race. It's many races, many short races, one after another. And then have any of you ever been down uh, to the river bluffs uh, near, uh, near Lake City or uh, Lake Pepin? You know what I'm talking about? Have you been there? I've been to Lake Pepin. <laughs> have, you, have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? Yes. yes. Yeah. 
Awesome, right? Remarkable, right? Somebody wrote this. A river cuts through rot, not because of its power, because, but because of its persistence. And so the formation that we could see in Lake City, Lake Pepin, that was not something that happened overnight. The Grand Canyon took millennia to form. And I think that in a world like ours that is so used to instant fixes and overnight solutions, and maybe even more than instant fixes, like, like immediate fixes, this idea of having to do things over and over and over again for a long period of time, it's probably something that we don't value as much as we once did. So these are those statements then uh, that, that kind of are the part of our lives that we need to realize we're called to think about perseverance. And so does scripture. So if you would, Kira, could you go to that next page where it has the scripture? Um, would anybody like to volunteer to, to read out loud that scripture from the NRSV? And you'll see that there are two versions this, this week. The NRSV is, is the version of scripture that most mainline Protestants in the U.S. and in Europe have adopted as the best, best, most literal and accurate translation of the scripture these days. People like me grew up with the RSV, maybe a bit before that people grew up the, with the King James Version. But the NRSV, in essence, right now is the gold standard. Then you'll see below it a, a, a version called The Message. The message was written by a fellow by the name of Eugene Peterson. Peterson uh, was a biblical scholar, both of Old and New Testament, uh, a brilliant fellow who actually went up into the mountains of Montana with every biblical source he had and his computer, and he wrote the Bible in modern day colloquial English, trying to put it into a, a transliteration, not a direct one for one translation, but rather a transliteration that might use idioms that they might not use then, but could make some sense for us today. So let's do some comparison and contrast. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Would somebody like to read that NRSV version loud and proud and not in too much of a hurry? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Disregarding its shame, he has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this text may be familiar to you. It may not be. Uh, we'll, we'll get into more of the depth of this text after we talk about its context. But now, just as comparison and contrast, let's read it using this message version that Peterson has put together, because it might, it might speak in more contemporary language than that first version. Uh, some people like this, some people don't. But would somebody read that Hebrews 12 text from the message? I can. Thank you. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we better get on with it. <laughs> Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the presence, in the place of honor, right alongside God. When you find yourself flagging in your faith, Go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through that will shoot adrenaline into your soul. <laughs> now, there are a whole lot of words that are not in the original Greek. But how do you feel about the way he has characterized that text? Does it, does it strike you uh, maybe as an amplification of what you heard or 
something that that might um, either warm your heart or put a smile on your face? Or how, how do you feel about that text you just read? I like it. In fact, I read through the message and then I sent it to my brother who has no clue, mm -hmm. thinking <laughs> that, that he would understand and accept Christ mm -hmm. that way. But. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Still hasn't worked, but <laughs> you know, um, one of the spiritual disciplines that Kira may again, I think, I think that there are very few people anymore, and maybe this is just a overgeneralization, who who read the Bible just as a daily as a daily practice, as a as a as a devotional practice, where where folks will just read their way through it. Um, I've done a whole lot of funerals in my life, and I got to tell you, one of the things that's the most heartwarming um, experience that a pastor can have is when, when you go to the nursing home or you go to their home, and they'll say, "Hey, pastor, would you like to see so and so's Bible?" Yes, please. And it's and it's dog-eared, right? It's dog-eared, and it's underlined, and it's it's got tears on the pages, and and probably some coffee, and maybe a donut grease spill or two. Um, and, and you'll see that this Bible has been something that people have lived with. And one of the reasons I love the message is that when you sit down and read it, you can, you can just read it almost like you might read a, a novel as a story. And, and I think that's the particular gift that, that uh, Eugene Peterson offers. And so as we start digging into these texts, we might go back and forth to them. So so let's just do a little orientation, a little Bible orientation, and start with, uh, with, with where this, this scripture finds itself. Um, uh, okay, here's a quick test. Um, in our scripture, friends, we say that there are, um, there are two major groupings of scripture, kind of divided uh, before the time of Jesus and after the time of Jesus. What do we call them? The New Testament and the Old Testament. Right. Right, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Now there are some who would uh, who would say that that's a good that's a good understanding, but some would say, you know what? Maybe a more accurate way to put it would be would be that there is this uh, this testament, this covenant, the story that tells the story of the Hebrews. So they might call they might call that that first portion of, of the Bible the Hebrew Scriptures. And and if I were to hold up my Bible here, you would see that it's that much, right? Right. And then on the other hand, there are these things that we would call the Christian scripture, the Old and the New Testament. If you use if you use Jesus as the linchpin, as you use Jesus as that fulcrum point, there are all of the stories of the faith that lead up to the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And then there are the things that tell his story, and then lift up what happened in the early church after that. Now, we're not going to talk a lot about the Old Testament today, but let's talk about the New Testament. Um, friends, um, for, for conversation's sake, how many Gospels are there? Four. Pardon me? Four. 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 Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all stories of that life of Jesus. It's interesting to note that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Syn means together, optic means see, see together. Matthew, Mark, and Luke pretty much tell the same stories from different perspectives. If you have ever witnessed uh, an accident uh, with somebody else, Depending upon where you're standing, you could you could say, "Here's what happened," or or maybe you've witnessed a particular event, and depending upon what kind of seats you got, I mean, it, it it changes your perspective. But we do say that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are these synoptic gospels, and they see the story pretty much from the same perspective. And then along comes John. Kira, how much do you love the Gospel of John? I'm learning to love it. Yeah, <laughs> I am learning. Cure, cure I doesn't... like the narrative of the synoptic yeah. gospels. Yeah. I, and I I want somebody to tell me what I'm supposed to know. <laughs> well, and, and yeah, and, and the gospel of John, of course, is much more filled with symbolism. 
right? right? It's, it's, it's this symbolic sort of understanding. And so it's important to note that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were probably the first of the Gospels written. And, and John, John was written after that. And it was written, written for the, with the idea of trying to make a broader interpretation of this whole large text. Now, just interesting to note, if you think about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, you will note that right between the Gospels and, the Paul, and Paul's letters is another wonderful book called The Acts of the Apostles. If you've done any reading in Luke, you will know that the person who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts is likely the same person. In fact, in fact, you might say that it's two parts of one book. The Gospel of Luke tells the story before Jesus and his death and resurrection and, and all of that. And then the book of Acts tells the story of the, that early church of Peter and Paul and all of those disciples who were martyred for the faith, who gave their lives. Now then, we're getting to the meat where we want to talk about today. Right after that comes the major section of scripture that's called the letters. The letters. If you were to pick up your New Testament and hold it up, you'd have to come to the conclusion that a fellow by the name of Paul probably wrote more of that New Testament than anybody else. In his letter to the Romans and the Corinthians and the Ephesians and the Galatians and all those letters. And right at the end of the book of Philemon, which is the shortest book in the entire Bible, comes the book of Hebrews, where we're at right now. After that, come all of the other letters that were written by other leaders in the church and not Paul. Now, the interesting thing is that historically speaking, people have often thought that Paul was the person who wrote the book of Hebrews. That is debated because the style of writing is very, very different. Very, very different from any of the other writings. And how is that the case? The vocabulary is very complicated in the book of Hebrews. The syntax is very complicated. Um, when, when somebody like Kira is studying a Koine Greek for the first time, they don't drop you in the book of Hebrews and say, all right, start to translate. Because it's, it's highfalutin language. It's, it's filled with poetry and imagery, and it's beautiful, but it's not exactly like the other letters that Paul wrote. It, it's different. It's, it's significant in that it has one purpose and one purpose only. And the purpose of this book is to say that through Christ, we have direct access to God. Now, in, in the tradition of the church and in the tradition of, 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 the early, of the early religious experience of the Hebrews, in order to get to God, you had to use some sort of system. In the Old Testament, what was the system that gave people access to God? Religious leaders? Sacrifices. Yeah, sacrifices. 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 Yep, religious leaders who were given the task of having sacrifices, but it really was driven by the machine of the temple. And if you wanted to get closer to God, you had to make this sacrifice to appease God, right? It was kind of a tit for tat. If you want God to pay attention to you, you got to burn an offering that God can smell somewhere up there or, or that would gain God's attention because it was a major sacrifice that you made. In the New Testament, we believe that there is someone else who took the place of that sacrificial lamb, and that's Jesus. And in the book of Hebrews particularly, it argues that we don't have to go through any system. We don't have to go through any leader. We don't have to go through any religion particularly to have access to Jesus because Jesus is with us always and everywhere. Now, for us as Christians living in this century, we might not think that's such a, a, an outlandish idea, but you got to understand for millennia, that's not how the church was understood. And even now, you might argue, even now you might argue that in some religious traditions, uh, maybe even our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church, that in order to get to Christ, you might have to use an intermediary, um, someone who could be a buffer. Um, anybody know what day it is tomorrow? St. Patrick's Day. Isn't it St. Patrick's Day? It's St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> it is. It is, it, and it's also Thursday, right? 
Uh, and it's St. Patrick's Day. And you know the story of St. Patrick who, who chased the snakes out of Ireland, by the way. They weren't really snakes. They were probably the Druids who practiced this weird religion. And he's the guy who used the shamrock to identify Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Has nothing to do with four-leaf clovers or pots of gold. But, but there are some people, and very re religious and devout people, who, who will wear medals around their neck. Like uh, St. Christopher, right? And St. Christopher, you may know, is the patron saint of travelers. Travelers. I think uh, St. Patrick is the patron saint of green beer, I think. <laughs> He's still with me, friends. Um, this, this is vitally important to understand that the book of Hebrews is here to tell us that we don't have to pray to some saints and God bless Mary, right? God bless Mary. I think Mary has a unique position in the pantheon of those who are followers of Jesus as the mother of our, of our Savior. But I don't believe that God expects us to pray through Mary to get to God or pray through a saint to get to God, right? This book of Hebrews helps us understand that in our lives, we don't need that intermediary we have this Savior whose name is Jesus, and he is our access to God. Now, the text in question, here we are, kind of going through what is the Bible story. This text in question, um, uh, how many of you have spent any time in athletics? Anybody? Bueller? <laughs> Another re reference to old movies that some of you should not know about. Um, one of the cool things about, about this book of Hebrews is that it uses agricultural images, it uses educational images, it uses images of the family, but it, here in this particular portion of the text, it uses an athletic image that would have been very, very obvious to the readers who were there. Um, uh, did any of you watch the Winter Olympics this last couple of months? Yeah. Yep, and some of you know the root of the Olympics is, is really, it goes back to Mount Olympus and, and the decathlon and, and that marathon and all of those things. Those early Greeks who engaged in these athletic contests to, to set themselves apart and also to prove their strength, their courage, and maybe their endurance and perseverance. Um, one of the things that's, that's very interesting, I think, is that anybody who's done any athletics understands that ultimately there really is no shortcut, right? There is no shortcut. Um, the reason that somebody can hit a baseball, which is the hardest thing to do in sports, a pitched ball traveling at 100 plus miles an hour with a stick is because they practiced it over and over and over and over and over again. The reason that somebody like Tiger Woods got to be such a phenom when he was only 20 was because when he started at three years old, he hit that ball thousands of times. It was something that was repeated over and over and over again. Um, what's been troublesome, I think, is to see how sometimes people want a shortcut. People want to get past the hard work. Um, I don't know, are any of you guys baseball fans? Baseball fans, anybody? No. No, I kind of am. I am. I'm really looking forward to baseball. But one of the things that really screwed up baseball for me was the use of steroids. And now in the record books, the things that set apart the, the heroes of the sport, some of them have this asterisk behind their name because their poor performance has been questioned because they juiced, because they used a drug. And uh, they were looking for a shortcut. Um, one of the things I think that most of us have come to understand in our lives is that, is that if you want to get better at something, you probably have to work at it. Um, there's actually a theory out there among, among uh, cognitive psychologists and developmental psychologists that say, if you want to get good at any particular activity, you need to spend almost 10,000 hours working on it if you want to be a concert violinist, if you want to be a good woodworker, 
if you want to be if you want to be somebody who has the capacity um, to to do important and significant things in the world of politics, you got to put the time in. You got to pay the price. Um, and again, boy, this this will date me. How many of you have heard the phrase "no pain, no gain"? Mm -hmm. Right? No pain, no gain. Now, I think that sometimes people take that to a radical um, kind of gross extent. But if you were to talk to somebody who was a gifted athlete, I think they would say, you got to pay your dues. You got to pay your dues. And so here, here in this particular text, um, we are looking at a person who understands this athletic metaphor based on the world in which he's lived. And he's trying to remind them by pointing at athletes that that might be an example of how we might live our lives spiritually and recognize that, that the faith is not all pie in the sky, that the faith is not all sunshine and roses. Um, boy, this will date me here again. I keep coming up with these cultural references. Um, do any of you remember the song, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden? Yeah, I know Anybody? that one. You know, you know that one? Yeah. I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden. Uh, one of the things I think that makes God kind of shake his head in heaven above and Jesus and the Holy Spirit talk about with some regularity is, is the current batch of, of preachers, prosperity preacher, preachers, who will say things like, if you pray hard enough, God will give you a good parking spot. <laughs> Really, really, or or if um, if uh, if you if you hold that Bible high and and claim that this Bible is is the source of your strength in life, that you're going to have success in your career. Um, I could go on to name some of them. I won't. Joel Osteen, um, but there are other preachers like that who will preach exactly the opposite of what this text says. Being a disciple of Christ is something that will cost us something. Now, I referred to uh, one martyr of the faith earlier, Martin Luther King Jr. Let me refer to another one. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor in World War, during World War II who gave up a cushy job at Union Seminary in, in, in New York and went back to fight in the resistance against Hitler in World War II. And you know what it cost him? his life, his life. Just as the American forces were cresting the hill down from the camp where Bonhoeffer was being held, they brought him to the gallows and they hung him out to die just before he could receive liberation. Discipleship, Bonhoeffer would say, is costly. That's not to say that it doesn't come with benefits, but it also has challenges. And if we want to see who faced that challenge first, let's look at Hebrews 12. Okay, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race is, that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the one who ran the race first. As a new grandpa, one of the most exciting things that I have seen in my recent days is to watch one of our grandchildren start to take their first steps, right? Their first steps. And I, I believe that one of the things that encourages a child to take their steps more than anything else is a mom or a dad at the end of the course saying, come on, I'm here. I'm here. Um, there's an old phrase that's used over and over again in the context of the faith. Christians need not fear the future because we know who holds the future. This text is telling us that as we run our race of life, one of the things that we can look at, like a child looks at a loving parent, like, like, um, like a coach, like a student looks at a coach at the end of the race saying, you can do it. There is this, there is this, this 
pioneer, a perfecter, Jesus, who ran the race before us, who did it, endured the cross, disregarded its shame, and now sits at the right hand of God, who is cheering us on. Cheering us on. A word of encouragement. A word of hope. A word of promise. So before we talk too much more about, about the last portion of the text, uh, I'd, I'd like to just turn focus on, on what's my and our story. Um, one of the things that Kira has done to help us with these spiritual practices is to try to make um, the story of scripture more intimate to us, more, more a part of our lives, something that we live and we breathe. Um, when we think about perseverance in the Christian faith, I would propose to you that there are, there are external roadblocks for us as we run our race of life, and there are internal obstructions. When you think about those things that may have tripped you up, and again, um, you can be um, uh, as open or, or as you'd like to be, when you think about running your race or living your life, walking your walk as a Christian person, what are some of those external roadblocks that have been thrown up that might cause us either to trip or fall or stumble? What do you think some of them might be? Money. Money. Say more about that. I think our wants of this world sometimes overshadow what God's wants are for us. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so actually even almost um, the God who we are called to worship might even be displaced by that because we want those things that we want. Right. Um, um, what about, um, I don't know, I actually have some friends who, who, who question, who wonder how I could possibly be a Christian person based on the tragedies that we see in our world and what they consider to be the absence of God. They will say, if your God is so gracious and so merciful, why do all these, again, to quote another amazing book, why do all these bad things happen to good people? Right? It's an external roadblock. Society will call into question the heart of our faith by saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're you're worshiping something that that really doesn't um, doesn't add up. It doesn't it doesn't make sense. So money might be one of them. Um, the resistance that we might feel from our culture about the faith. Are there other roadblocks that come from the outside that might slow you down or trip you up? Having having time. <laughs> Say more about that, David. Well, there's so many distractions. And I feel like there's more and more distractions with uh, more modern day living, uh, electronics. Uh, people never have time to, quiet time to think about God because mm -hmm. they're always busy doing something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just the distractions in the world. I think sometimes we are so captivated by what's important we don't focus on what's really crucial. Does that make sense? Because all these things are important. They're, yeah, the distraction in the world. So are you watching TikTok every night, Dave, then? Is that what you're doing? Or? <laughs> I can't say I am. I, what, what is TikTok? I don't want you to even know what TikTok is. Yeah. TikTok, TikTok is, uh, is <laughs> a time it's suck. A, it's, it's a time suck. Yeah. It, it, uh, it's, it's part of the reason I quit Facebook, you know, probably almost 10 years ago, because it, I recognized it made connections, but I also realized that it just exposed me to all sorts of junk I didn't need to see. And when I saw some of my friends posting some things that I thought were crazy, it made me think less of them. <laughs> uh, so, so we've got this time suck. We've, we've got, we've got, the, the, the curse of, of wanting to keep up with the Joneses or keep up with my own needs. Uh, we, we've got, uh, we've got the, the resistance in the world to religion and faith. Are there any other things that are external roadblocks that might trip us up as we run our race of life? Insecurity. 
Ah, yeah. And you know, I think maybe you've bridged right us to the next one, that, that those internal things, those internal things that, that get in our way, that insecurity. Would you be willing to say a little bit more about that? Well, I, you know, I have a lot of family members who don't believe. Yeah. And I, you know, I try to talk to them about it, but I don't always have the right words and I'm not sure I'm got saying the right scripture. And I just don't feel secure enough myself to lead them in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I read my Bible every morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you do. Mm -hmm. And and this and this isn't to take you off the hook anyway, in any way. But there is an old phrase, and it exact, actually comes from First John. How will they know we are Christians? I try to to live that way, so I mean, they they know I'm I'm different, mm -hmm. but I don't know if they want to be like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the Bible says, "By our love." Mm -hmm. And I know that's true from the conversations that we've had before. And, and I, I, I want to say that as someone who's heard a few of those stories, I believe that by your love of these folks, as evidenced by your caring for them, that, that perhaps, just perhaps, some of that love of God might get through to them too. But, and, and again, we're all insecure about, about sharing our faith. Um, gosh, what is the joke that Pastor Anders used to tell? What do you get when you cross a Jehovah's Witness with a Lutheran? Somebody who knocks on your door with no apparent reason at all? And nothing to say? As Lutherans, we have been, um, and again, not to take pot shots at the denomination and the group of people that I love, but we have not been so willing to share our faith because we thought we had to have everything perfect, right? I got to have just the right words. I got to have just the right, the right stuff. Um, but maybe just maybe one of the obstructions that you've, you've talked about is that, is that sense of insecurity. If I don't have it all together, then I got nothing to say. And and I can tell you, my friend, I know you have something to say. What are some of those other internal roadblocks or, or obstructions? Anybody else? Do you think one of them might be fear of rejection? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or fear of looking foolish? Or fear of being painted as one of those uh, those religious types, um, being judged. Um, everybody's got those internal obstructions, and everybody's got those external roadblocks. But here, what I want to encourage you to think about is is that in response to all of those things, that that there are there are three images that I'd like to lift up: standing up, bouncing back and keeping on. Um, there's a famous phrase that says, all it takes for evil to thrive in this world is for good people to do nothing. Right? This morning, did any of you hear the impassioned speech given by the president of the Ukraine asking for help? Did any of you hear that? I did. I didn't. He made his address to Congress this morning, was it? Yes. Yeah. Who, who said that they heard it? Dave. What did, you, what, did you feel, what did you feel when you heard it, Dave? I thought, I thought that president is doing a heck of a job. And there were parts of it, especially the video, I guess, that practically brought tears to my eyes. But, but we need to do something. If, if you're talking about, I mean, I, I can understand both sides. I can understand the fear of starting a world war uh, versus helping the Ukrainian people. I mean, I, I understand, I feel like I understand both sides and it's not, a, there's not an easy fix by any means. Mm -hmm. But I was very impressed with the president of 
of you, the Ukraine. He's proven himself to be to be something. Well, perseverance, strength, courage for crying out loud. He's not run away. He's right there. Um, it's it's amazing to think about uh, when you think about about standing up, about standing up, uh, facing the cost, paying the price. Um, Kira and I, Kira and I often will have conversations about about our friends, the millennials, and then and then. Uh, then they'll have conversations about people like me, the baby boomers, and then they'll talk about people like Kira who are, are, are you Generation X, Kira, whatever? I don't know. Technically, there's a new classification for us. I'm an Xennial. An Xennial. Yes, oh. I have my own, I am my own classification, Jeff. <laughs> yep, yep. And so, so the millennials, the millennials and the younger ones will look at us old farts and they'll say, oh, you stick in the mud. You want to do things the way you've always done it before, and that's and that's crazy. Um, we're not going to get into this uh, this war or this sort of conflict because because it's not worth the price that's going to be paid. And then people like me will say, "Well, you don't, you young whippersnappers, our country's been at war for the last forty years. It's just that we've never had to pay the price for it." I mean, I I'm old enough to remember my mom and dad and grandparents talking about ration books and no gasoline not just a gasoline that's over the top in price and so i think that we have been taught that that it's one thing to stand up and proclaim our truth and it's often my truth that's the new phrase i want to share with you my truth but we're not always willing to pay the price for it and i and i think that's across all generations i'm not trying to take pot shots Bouncing back, I think this is one of the most important characteristics that anybody who has resilience can really uh, show. Um, there are people who I have known in my life who I have admired with great, uh, almost great jealousy and watched their capacity to bounce back again and again and again and again. People who seem to be eternally optimistic and not just optimistic, but hopeful. Um, and there are also the people who just kind of keep on keeping on. They just keep on keeping on. Um, I think about I think the, about the people that I've respected, who have faced incredible adversity, multiple illnesses in their family, all sorts of heartbreaks, uh, economic setbacks, and if you ask them how you doing, they'll say, "Pretty good, thank you. I'm grateful." So it's time to keep to get ready to wrap up, but I just want to move on to that last thing the, in search of resilience. Um, here are some things I think that might help build our resilience. Um, I love I love the acronym COWS, C-O-W-S, Cloud of Witnesses. This particular metaphor that, that, that the writer of the Hebrews is using is an athletic metaphor that's based on the experience of a stadium. Picture a stadium where there's a crowd all around the people who are running the race of life. The ones who are running the race of life are still are still tripping and falling and trying to jump over obstacles and, and facing all of those difficulties and getting exhausted and tired. But in the stands, there is that cloud of witnesses. And this particular cloud of witness refers, refers to those people that have gone before us and died. When I preached at my dad's funeral and talked to his grandchildren and talked about how grandpa was always in the stands cheering for them at all their games, not only did they get a tear in their eye, they were reminded that we believe that God brings those that we love to be with him, much as he brought Jesus to be there, and that we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses that cheers for us as we run this race of life. Um, I'm not sure who your cloud of witnesses might include, but I, I want you to imagine, imagine those folks who are in heaven above right now who are cheering for you as you run this race of life, that cloud of witnesses. And more than that, I would encourage you to think about those people who are your cheerleaders in this world today. When you need resilience, allow those people to encourage you. Of course, the second point is to look to Jesus, recognizing that Jesus has run that race before. Um, in the text for this Sunday, we're gonna read, we're gonna read the shortest Bible verse that every confirmation student wants to memorize and it's Jesus wept. But to me, it gives great comfort when I look to Jesus, when I'm down and blue, and all I want to do is cry, or all I can do is cry. 
that I can look to Jesus who ran this race before me and realize that he wept too. Gives me hope, gives me courage, maybe some perseverance. Um, reframing. There's a fancy word that, that therapists will use, uh, but you'll, you'll get it right away. It's called catastrophizing. Sometimes we get caught in a trap where we make everything a catastrophe. Um, it, it just, it couldn't be, it couldn't possibly be worse than it, what it is right now. And usually we have to say, yeah, probably could. And maybe sometimes we just need to reframe the situations that we're in and realize that perhaps, just perhaps, it's not as much of a catastrophe as we've made it. And perhaps with some perspective from people on our cloud of witnesses, they can help us see that. And when we look to Jesus, he might provide us some perspective. And then last but not least, um, I have learned this because mentors have taught me this. One of the best ways to experience perseverance in your own life is by encouraging others to persevere. Does that make sense? You hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Encouraging other people to persevere, saying, you know what? You've got this in you. You've got a God who loves you. You've got people who support you. Uh, we know it's hard. We see that it's hard, but you're not alone. I'm with you every step of this journey. In fact, if you will ask people who are grieving, who are experiencing great loss, they will tell you the most important thing that happens is when somebody simply shows up and is with them. So let's move on to a fable, and this will give us our chance to, uh, to wrap things up. Uh, it's called The Farmer and the Donkey. And uh, I always like these fables because they might give us a little bit of humor, but like most fables, there's more truth to them than we think. And so would somebody like to read us the fable of the farmer and the donkey? I can. Thank you. One day a farmer's donkey fell down into a well. The farmer cried piteously for hours. Wait, no, who cried? Oh, the animal did. I'm sorry. Thank yep. you. Cried piteously for hours as the farmer tried to figure out what to do. Finally, he decided the animal was old and the well needed to be covered up anyway. It just wasn't worth it to retrieve the donkey. All right, stop. You see the stage it's set here? Okay. I wonder how many times you might've been the donkey. I wonder how many times you might've been the farmer, but let's keep going. He invited all his neighbors to come over and help him. They all grabbed a shovel and began to throw dirt into the well. First, the donkey realized what was happening and cried horribly. Then, to everyone's amazement, he quieted down. A few shovels, shovel loads later, the farmer finally looked down the well. He was astonished at what he saw. With each shovel of dirt that hit his back, the donkey was doing something amazing. He would shake it off and take a step up. As the farmer's neighbors continued to shovel dirt on top of the animal, the donkey would shake it off and take a step up. Pretty soon, everyone was amazed as the donkey stepped up over the edge of the well and happily trotted off. Life is going to shovel dirt on you, all kinds of dirt. The trick to getting out of the well is to shake it off and take a step up. Each of our troubles is a stepping stone. We can get out of the deepest wells just by not stopping, never giving up. Shake it off and take a step up. Do you like that parable? Do you like that story? It's good. I agree. I agree. Um, like any parable, like any story, you can push it to its limits and, and there will be things that won't quite match up to our human experience. But first off, <laughs> What an ingenious thing. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of the old phrase that people have said, if you, if you find yourself in a hole, for heaven's sake, stop digging. You know, that's the first step, right? Is to stop digging deeper. And now here to, to push that metaphor just a little further, it reminds us that as this stuff is piling up on us, maybe the thing that we can do, that, we're ought, that we ought to do is, is to is to trust that we can shake some of these things off and take a step up. Um, yeah, so, so here we are at the end of our time. We're a little bit over. 
Um, anybody have any parting comments or, or curiosities or, or things that you'd like to share as we get ready to wrap up today? I guess I would share that in perseverance, in shaking it off, in dwelling in this resiliency that we're being called to, that we also leave space for the brokenness that it brings, right? The grief that it brings and yes, shaking it off. Like Pastor Jeff said, you know, it can, you can take it so far as to like read something different into it. But I think um, when partnered with that scripture, it reminds you that you don't have to go it alone in this persevering, in the resilience and that brokenness that it, that it leaves behind um, can create something new. I, I'm reminded of the image of a cracked pot and how in China, they fill that crack pot with gold, right? And that the crack is even more beautiful than it was before. And I think of that resilience in us, in the cracked and the brokenness of our resilience, it, we can be more beautiful than before. Here, I, I think your insight, your insight is right on. It is right on. Uh, I, I think that a story like this could potentially trivialize yeah. a perseverance. But I, I think in context, when we think yeah. about the price, the price that Jesus paid, the honesty of those folks who have paid that price before, right. perseverance isn't, isn't, you know, I don't know, I don't know how many times I've heard people say this lately, getting old isn't for wimps, <laughs> you know, just isn't, right. just isn't. Thank you, Kira. What a, what a great insight. What a great insight. Any, anybody else? I think we're good. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks uh, for your presence. Um, we will continue next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, if you would be willing to wake the neighbors and call the kids and invite other people to come, uh, this might be a chance for you to actually uh, do that risky thing that we talked about earlier and, and run that race, walk that walk. Um, it is true that the vast majority of people who find their way to church, the vast majority are those who have been invited by others, appointed by some others. And so I think that's something we just need to remember. Um, so uh, thanks Kira for setting that spiritual practice. I, um, I don't have a copy of that. Would you, could you email me a copy of that? Cause I'd like to use it. Heck yeah. I'll email one to you Kirsten too. Great. Thank you. And um, God bless you all. Um, just know that you'll remain in my prayers. And um, for now, peace, everybody. Bye, Pastor Jeff. Bye. Adios. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye, Bye, -bye. Kirsten. Rest up. Bye, Kirsten. Bye, everybody.